Hello, students. Welcome back. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be further exploring this week's topic, natural selection. You may have recalled from yesterday, we watched a few introductory videos to give us some background information about natural selection and the influence that Charles Darwin, our scientist of the week, had in utilizing this principle in order to support the theory of descent from common ancestry, otherwise known as evolution. And so today we're going to continue with this theme of natural selection. So if you haven't done so already, please make sure you turn over to your notes to the appropriate page. And let's begin with uh, working on our notes in our book for natural selection. So yesterday, if you recall, as we were discussing natural selection, we came up with a, a definition of sorts for natural selection. And it is the survival and reproduction of organisms best adapted to their surroundings. And we explored some different examples, including giraffes and frogs and bacteria. And I can't recall if we used anything else as well, the bugs and the uh, on the leaf. Uh, but these various examples that we explored yesterday illustrate the principle of natural selection, which simply is that uh, all organisms, no matter how big or how small, have certain characteristics that they possess as a species. But it is only the survival and reproduction of organisms that are best adapted to their surroundings. So if the surroundings, if the environment is not conducive to a particular characteristic surviving, then that characteristic will be selectively weeded out by nature, so to speak. Thus the term natural selection. And we might understand this by a simple phrase called the survival of the fittest. Now, in the animal kingdom, if you think of the example from yesterday with the giraffes, only the fittest or the most suitable for survival, those with the longest necks, especially in years where uh, in a particular environment that the giraffes live in, maybe only the leaves are available way high on a tree. I'll tell you what, this past winter was pretty snow covered. And I noticed around this area that because of the snow covering lots and lots of plants, the deer were browsing in areas they don't normally browse. In fact, uh, at my parents' property, they were browsing all of the rhododendrons that they normally don't even eat. But you could see a browse line all around, basically the height of deer throughout their yard and other yards for that matter too. So if there were any tiny deer roaming around this past winter, they may not have fared as well. They may not have been as fit as those deer that were taller for this past winter, just as a local illustration. But yesterday, we also talked about our scientist of the week, Charles Darwin. And I think we gained a better understanding of who Charles Darwin was, especially in the context of his voyage on the ship called the Beagle back in 1831, as he traveled around our planet for a period of about five years and saw and did some remarkable things. Now, on board the Beagle, he was actually technically the ship's naturalist, which back in those days meant he was pretty much, other than the captain, probably the only educated individual on the ship with a knowledge of science. So he probably served as the doctor of the ship as well. But as the ship's naturalist, he certainly was most interested in studying the plants and the animals 
that their voyage encountered as they traveled around the world. Not unlike the Lewis and Clark expedition in North America after the Louisiana Purchase, when they traveled into unknown lands to see what kinds of plants and animals lived there. Charles Darwin was doing that as well uh, around the entire globe, and he recorded a lot of his observations. Now, one particular location that has become almost synonymous with the name Charles Darwin were the observations he made in the archipelago or the group of islands known as the Galapagos Islands. The Galapagos Islands, as you can see on this map, are a cluster of islands or an archipelago off the coast of South America. And it was really due to many of his observations made during his stay on these islands that really caused him to develop the various ideas and theories that he came up with. One of the differences that he observed were among certain species of animals, in particular finches. Darwin was famous for his observation of finches and the differences that existed between the beaks of these birds among the same species between the mainland and the island dwelling uh, finches. And he noticed that on different islands, there were different characteristics that were more prevalent than others based upon the diet that was available to these birds on the different islands. It was almost as if these birds were superbly adapted to life on their particular islands based on their food source. And it was later in life that Darwin recognized that perhaps it was members of this species found on the mainland that migrated out to sea to the different islands, perhaps at a similar period in time. And over time, these individual species or these individual birds within the species had certain characteristics, probably common characteristics at the beginning, but because of ge geographic isolation and the fact that different islands harbor different vegetation, these particular characteristics were naturally selected over time to encourage the reproduction of only those members of the species that were, in fact, well adapted to the particular food source available to them. And those that were not adapted to life on those islands, their characteristics were not naturally selected, and they those characteristics eventually died off. And that is kind of the basic premise of natural selection. Other animals that Charles Darwin was famous for observing and analyzing and exploring were the, the tortoises. In fact, there's a tortoise on the Galapagos Islands called the uh, the Darwin's tortoise. In, in fact, the tortoises back then were so big that a fully developed, mature sailing man could fit inside the shell of a dead Galapagos tortoise and use it as a bathtub, believe it or not. So in addition to the, uh, the finches and the tortoises, he also studied the penguins, the cormorants, which is a type of bird, iguanas, a type of lizard, and of course, the finches, most famous for uh, the work on the Galapagos Island by Charles Darwin. Now, there are three factors of natural selection that we are going to be exploring in this lesson today. And the one key point I want you to remember throughout this lesson is simply this. It is only the survivors that get to pass on their genes. And I'm not talking about the pants that they are wearing, but rather the genetic information that they carry with them on their DNA.
Only those that survive through adulthood are those that are capable of passing on that genetic material to their offspring. So in a population, a given population of whatever the species might be, there's going to be variability. Just like we see in this classroom, there's a lot of variability in the characteristics of different students. But let's say that we all lived in an environment that only selected or only promoted or allowed the survival of certain ones of those characteristics. And the rest of us died out before we had the ability to pass on our genes to the next generation. Well, nature would be selecting survivors to pass on their genes. And so let's talk about these three factors of natural selection. Number one, and we'll explore these in greater detail as we examine each one. Number one is overproduction. I actually have a friend of mine who just literally just texted me some pictures. In fact, if you don't believe me, I'll show you. He just texted me some pictures, believe it or not, of a pond in his yard. And uh, in this pond, there are spring peepers. In fact, I'm going to show you the pictures here. And so he, here's the pond. See the pond? And he showed me this picture of these frogs. And these spring peepers, these frogs right now, are mating with one another. And as soon as they mated, he actually sent me this picture as well. And this is a picture of the frog eggs. Check them out. There are hundreds and hundreds of frog eggs in this one particular mass of eggs from just two frogs reproducing. So from those two frogs reproducing, and by the way, there are dozens, if not hundreds of frogs in his pond reproducing right now. But that one female frog laid that whole mass of eggs, just like we see in this picture here of Nemo and all of his brothers and sisters, so to speak, lots and lots of eggs here. There are many animals, many species that produce many more offspring to replace themselves than, than just the two parents. And there are reasons for that, which we'll get to. But in this example of overproduction, there is an incredible amount of variation within each of those eggs. As we can see in this picture of ladybugs, the ladybugs come in a whole host of varieties, and you'll see some of them have uh, more dots than others, for instance. But we have variation within a species as well. And finally, the third factor that affects natural selection is what biologists call mirroring, or everyday people we call kind of camouflage. Camouflage mirroring to a biologist. If we check this out, I wonder if you can see the fact that there are not one, there's not one moth, but there are two moths in this picture. We can easily see the white one here. Can you see the dark colored one as well? Maybe after I point it out, you can see it. But this particular moth mirrors its dark environment, making it easier for that one to survive and not be picked out so easily as the light colored one from a predator. So now let's explore these three factors affecting natural selection. Overproduction. Overproduction is when you have a situation where the rate of reproduction is greater than the carrying capacity. In that very first picture I showed you of the frog eggs and the frogs, it's a small pond where my friend lives, and uh, there's a lot of eggs. That one little pond cannot possibly sustain the population of frogs if all of those frog eggs hatched into frogs and consumed the resources. So we have a situation of over 
reproduction. The reproductive rate is much higher than the environment can sustain. That's one of the definitions of overproduction. Now, certain things come into play when we consider that. Number one, there's going to be a competition for resources. When all of those eggs develop into tadpoles and those tadpoles hatch, they're all going to be very hungry. And there's only a limited amount of food in that pond for those little fishies to eat, or rather tadpoles to eat. And so they're all going to be competing for a finite uh, amount of resources. And so in this context with tadpoles, only the strongest ones are going to survive because they are competing against one another. And as they compete against one another, well, the little runts of the litter are going to be pushed aside as the larger tadpoles are fighting for the food. And so the stronger tadpoles are going to be the ones who will inevitably win out as far as consuming the limited resources available to them. So this is one factor, though. Remember, there are others. So overproduction is one factor affecting natural selection. And I think you can see with the example of the tadpoles how that comes into play. But let's stick with the tadpoles for a moment because the second characteristic or rather the second factor affecting natural selection is variation. Variation can be defined as a diversity within a particular species. As I pointed out in one of the previous pictures of the ladybugs to you, not all ladybugs are exactly the same, and nor are all frogs exactly the same, nor are all humans or any other species for that matter. There's always variation within a species. And because of that variability that exists, and you can see, the vast variety and size and colors of these frogs here. But because of that variation that exists, that diversity within species, some of them are going to be better suited to survive than others. Maybe some of them have a genetic predisposition to survive warmer weather. And maybe this year we have a stretch of really warm, sunny days uh, during the course of this spring when these frogs are developing. As a result, only those that are best suited to survive the particular environment this year will be the ones that will be able to reproduce next year. And so the variation within the species is definitely a factor as to whether they are going to be passing on their genetic information to the next generation. And so in a way, you can think of variation as being described as the survival of the smartest. Now, that doesn't mean the most intelligent, but it does mean that uh, the adaptations that a particular species have make it more smart, so to speak, or smarter than others that don't have a particular characteristic. Again, this is not by choice. It's uh, in the case of animals, at least, it's not by choice that only the smartest ones survive. But those that are best suited are smart in their environment will have the ability to pass on their genes to the next generation. It brings us to the third factor, the mirroring effect or camouflage. Again, there is diversity within species. Uh, just this picture of these different moths here show us and illustrate the different colors and shapes and characteristics. And this diversity within a species again, enables there to be a wide variety of characteristics, morphologies or shapes and characteristics that enable some to better blend in with their environment. Look at this picture very closely. Maybe you didn't see it right away, but 
there's something hiding in the bark of this tree. Do you see it yet? Maybe you notice it now. Here are the eyes, the nose and beak. Here are the ears, or what appear to be ears, on the body of an owl. This owl is very well camouflaged. It mirrors its environment. It blends very well into its environment in such a way that it can get by without being consumed by a predator. In other words, we can think of this as the survival of the sneakiest. The survival of the sneakiest. In fact, look at this picture here. Do you see anything hidden in this picture? It's tough for me to see, and I know that it's here. But if you look very, very carefully, here we have the outline of a moth. Here's a moth. Do you see it? It's triangular in shape. Here are the triangular wings, and here is its elongated body. This is a pretty sneaky camouflage technique, I must say. It is blending in with the bark of that tree so well, even though I know it's there, I can barely even make it out. And, and that goes along with our example of our frog pond earlier in this period, in this lesson. You know, those frogs, uh, not only are they looking for food, but there are lots of birds that are also looking for food. And of those eggs that I showed you, of those spring peepers, those lovely sounding frogs that come out in springtime to mate, the vast majority of them will be eaten by birds, which is why it was necessary for the frogs to overpopulate that pond because so few of them survive. It sounds sad for the birds, but it sounds or sounds bad for the frogs, but it's great for the birds because the birds are taking full advantage of the overpopulated pond with tadpoles uh, in, you know, coming in the very near future, they're going to be consuming many of them. So if those tadpoles mirror the environment, they have a better chance of survival if they can hide more sneakily, if that's a word, in order to avoid being eaten. So there we have it. We have our three factors that are primarily responsible for explaining the principle behind natural selection. And over the next two days, you're going to explore this concept even more as you discuss how beaks are better or more poorly adapted to the food source available to them as you do an activity over the next two days with bird beaks. And again, Charles Darwin, famous for the Darwin finches on the Galapagos Islands and making some astute observations. And we're also going to do an activity with a species called the peppered moth. And we'll see how the history of England actually influenced the survival rate of the peppered moth and the variety within the species of whether it was a dark or a light colored moth. So interesting stories coming up with bird beaks and moths. So stay tuned for these activities over the next two days. But uh, until we get to those activities, I have some more things lined up for you in Google Classroom. So for now, I'd like you to go to Google Classroom and finish up your work for today as I say bye-bye.